And we're back for the first talk of day two of the ZK Summit. We're here with Daniel Benarash from Kedit. He's going to be talking about privacy preserving insight generation across siloed databases. So take it away, Daniel. And if anyone has any questions, please uh, remember to put them in the stage chat. And we're going to do a Q&A after the talk. Cool. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, and thanks, everyone, for, for being here. Um, I'm very happy to be talking today at the ZK Summit. Uh, it's actually the first time I'm talking here, which is really exciting for me. Um, I'm the director of research at Kedit, a company uh, uh, building enterprise products uh, for privacy data collaboration, private data collaboration. Um, some of you may know me from uh, ZK Proof. I'm, I'm a co-organizer there. So happy also to, uh, to answer questions about that if you have. But anyway, this, this talk is not about ZK Proof. I'm um, uh, going to so uh, just throughout the conversation throughout the presentation. Please feel free to ask questions on the chat. Uh, feel free to to sort of um, you know I, I won't be looking at the chat, but you know if there is anything important, then I'm I'm sure uh, we can talk about it either at the end or, or during. But anyway, I, I would like to um, to talk today about um, sort of how to generate insights across. Um, from from private data that are that is distributed or, or that is uh, coming from different sources, right? Um, so the goal is is exactly that. Like you have sort of different parties, say Alice and Bob and Charlie, that have their own databases, uh, and of course these is databases that they must be kept private. Um, but we want to essentially be able to compute on the sort of uh, uh, having these databases as inputs, right? Of course, we, we know that there is a primitive called uh, multi-party computation that does this. And there is today a lot of interesting uh, products and work being done. Um, the only uh, sort of challenge here or requirement is that when you do MPC in a cryptographic way, uh, you know that you need to have mm -hmm. uh, the actual sort of server that will, you know, enable the computation on your end. And, and many times these uh, generic MPCs are very interactive, so you need to be online, right? We know this. We know this from from several settings. Whereas what we need, you know, when we're selling uh, products in, in to enterprise, is something more that is something closer to like software as a service, right? Where you're just sort of logging into your account on the browser, and you have all the data and all the uh, product available, you know, just on a, 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 a click away kind of thing. So we don't want the the clients, the customers, to to have to sort of install servers. Uh, that they need to maintain. They, we don't want them to have sort of interaction between the servers, which is you know one of the biggest requirements that we have here. And uh, that kind of says that the reason for that is that we don't want to force them to stay online, right? Because it's definitely a, a, a sort of um, against the, the business or usability proposition. And if possible, we would like them not to have to maintain private keys, right? Permanent private keys. So aside from from this, um, yeah. So no, no private keys. Um, and in terms of sort of the product itself, like what what does it mean to generate insights? Well, there is sort of two different ways of of, of generating insights across databases, right? You have uh, one where where you could, for example, say, okay, I'm going to to sort of compute an insight or aggregate data uh, from two different sources about the same entity, right? It could be a company, it could be an individual, etc. Or you could essentially say, okay, I'm going to collect data uh, uh, from, from say, like an industry specific uh, use case or something. And, you know, I'm going to give back some, I don't know, industry statistics or benchmarks to give like a high level picture of the of the industry, right? And, and uh, these, these are just sort of two of these, but uh, these are the ones we kind of focus our product on. And here really the challenge is that um, we want to actually compute cryptography in a secure way, right? We don't want to give in sort of use, uh, you know, have, have the data and then just give insight. Like there's plenty of companies for that. This is not uh, the premise and we do privacy by design, right? And so the, the key challenge is how do we do cryptography securely on a decentralized sort of server, on a centralized server, sorry, right? Not, not decentralized as, as we are used to thinking in cryptography. Of course, you can think of several uh things, uh, uh, um, you know, cryptographic uh, primitives like homomorphic encryption, 
which is already practical. A lot of people are using it, but it's not really usable, right? The difference there between practical and usable is that, you know, it will take you, you know, a few hours, maybe a couple of days to, to compute on really large data, uh, some, some uh, you know, maybe some large circuits may, and so on. But it's not usable in the sense that if I'm, you know, a user uh, logging in and, and going online and, and, you know, uploading some data to get some, some you know, insights from my data, I don't want to have to wait a day, right? I want to upload it, get some data, maybe maximum, I don't know, an hour, maybe a couple of hours. I go get a coffee, go get lunch, something like this. But I'm working, right? It's my day day work, so I need to do this. And of course, you know, we could we could use other like more specific purpose ones, but we need to think that the functionality there is really limited by the cryptographic schemes, for example, like functional encryption, attribute-based encryption, order preserving encryption, all of these things are are well known and, and used in some settings. And so what are some of the, the insights that we could generate? You know, while uh, data ownership is key, really the, the, the collaboration part is where the value generation is going to be for companies, right? So we have something like, uh, you know, sharing insights in general, where, for example, the goal is that Alice will share with Bob some insights from her database. And here maybe the, the key is sort of saying, okay, how does Bob trust the insights, right? And, and this is also some some somewhere where uh, zero knowledge comes in, right? We all we're all aware around this issue of integrity of, of data and computation. Um, there is the um, sort of the, a, a different use case, which is more around aggregating data, right? If you have Alice, Bob, and Charlie who want to sort of compute the average of some values, either you know their own values or say you know uh, about some specific individuals. Uh, you know, for, for say fraud prevention, right, uh, in, in financial settings. Um, and the challenge here is that you must keep all of those values private uh, and actually receive the correct average, right? And the last sort of uh, use case that, that you know, or example that we have is um, matching identities, right? So again, Alice and Bob want to, uh, you know, they have companies and they want to know what are the clients that they have in common. You know, maybe they're going to have some kind of joint marketing campaign, they're partners and they want to generate, uh, you know, um, more assurance, for example, for KYC purposes. Um, and here the challenge is again that, you know, Alice cannot learn uh, the, the clients that are not common, the, Bob's clients that are not in common and vice versa, right? Um, and for this, we, the, this last one, we also use sort of this idea of PSI, right? PSI is um, a private set intersection. And what we do at Kedit, we call our protocol uh, the delegated PSI protocol, where we're going to actually do the, the sort of two steps, right? We're going to first match some uh, specific entries between data sets that are distributed across parties. And then we're going to use other tools to aggregate those uh, those that data or values that that come associated with 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 that data in order to generate insights. Um, so just a quick uh, sort of overview. Where I'm going to talk about sort of the different primitives that that we're going to use. Uh, I'll I'll present them and introduce them as we go. First, let's talk about what is private set intersection, right? So as I said, it's it's a very powerful technique for detecting matches and and duplicates across databases. So if you have Alice, uh, for example, Alice, Alice's customers on the left and Bob customers on the right, you really want to get to know all these sort of red triangles in the middle, right? But the key point is, as I said, that Alice should not learn the white triangles and Bob shouldn't learn uh, the blue triangles, right? And how do we do this? Well, one, you know, going back to sort of reminding uh, uh, the, the requirements, the design, require, the design requirements is that um we have sort of these usability models right where we want the participant essentially uh to have offline communication where we want the the the, the participants to just send one single message to kind of mm -hmm. upload the data and one message to receive the results right of the matches and insights um we call that the offline offline method offline model we also want in terms of state that the only state that they will maintain that the participants will maintain is their actual database right we don't want them to have like permanent keys. And if there are any keys, may maybe we can get them to be like per session, for example, per upload, right? Uh, just temporary and local. Um, and uh, in terms of server, as we said, we don't want them to have any server, right? So at a high level, what we do essentially is that we're actually delegating sort of, if you think about uh, the generic PSI uh, protocols that exist out there, we're delegating you know, the interaction between the, the participants in, in the MPC to some servers that are kind of sitting in a secondary line, okay? And we call these the delegates, 
So um, the clients are the participants, and then we have another set of servers that we call the delegates. And this is how it really looks like you have the participants um, that are sort of connected to a single entity, which acts as a proxy, which is which we call the matcher as well. And also you have the delegates connected to that. So there is, uh, you know, the participants interact only with the proxy as well as the delegates. And there are secure communication channels between the delegates and the participants, right? So that the matcher is not sort of an eavesdropper. Um, and um, this, this allows us to essentially uh, a, a remove all interaction and all servers and things like this from the participants. Now, there are a lot of existing works in PSI, but we actually deviate from those um, a little bit, right? We do use reuse some of the components because actually most of them require this interaction that I'm talking about that we don't want uh, in, in our product. Oh, there are some works that are like server server aided PSI, like like Google and Facebook have have done some work in that uh, area. Um, but it, there is still like the component of of having to to interact several times from the um, uh, side of the participant. And for our delegated PSI, what we use is sort of a combination of you know secret sharing scheme and and oblivious PRFs uh, and you know some some other nice tricks um, uh, around this interesting architecture, right? Um, so let's start by talking about secret sharing, right? The specifically the secret sharing that we use is very convenient and it's sort of this multiplicative secret sharing where, uh, essentially you have here sort of these delegates, D1, D2, D3, and each delegate is going to generate their own key, right? Key one, key two, and key three. And then what's going to happen is that, for example, the first delegate is going to, uh, take some, some group element G that is public or, or known to everyone, and he's going to compute uh, G to the K1, right? And then he's going to send G1 to, to the delegate two, and delegate two is going to add, right, on the exponent, uh, his secret or her secret, uh, and similar for uh, the, the third delegate. And at the end of the day, the third delegate is going to output the aggregate, the aggregated key, right? Um, uh, G to the K. Um, so yeah, so that's a that's a typo. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be uh, G here. It should be G to the K, where K is essentially the product of the three values, right? Of course, there is also like additive secret sharing and things like this, but we're interested in this specific um, secret sharing scheme because it doesn't have actual interaction and things like this. It's easy to generate, and it's also secure by by the discrete logarithm. Um, then we're gonna use the PRF, right? PRF stands for pseudo random functions. And the specific PRF we're going to use is sort of a, a hash to group function, uh, where we take a, a hash function like uh, SHA-256, uh, which we call here H, and we're going to map it into a group. Okay, so this is going to actually uh, be a hash to group. If, if this is reminiscent, like uh, in the sapling protocol that that was introduced, also uh, there is actual uh, you know standards uh, around this uh, for specifically the Ristretto uh, group. Um, and uh, then this uh, hash to group now being inside of a group, we can actually exponentiate by some uh, integer value, right, or fill element. And this is, you know, we call this uh, f of kx because it's a keyed uh, hash, and then it becomes a PRF. And there are like two main properties that we're interested. Uh, first, first one is really sort of randomness, where uh, as long as k is uniformly random, then you know f of kx is actually uh, sort of random and, and hides x and you, you uh, disable sort of brute forcing. And then you have this property of linearity, right? Which is sort of key homomorphic uh, in some sense. And then what, what happens is that if you do uh, f f k one of x to, to, to the k2, uh, you actually get f k one k2 of x, right? Similar uh, to how you would do uh, the secret sharing operation, right? Um, and so what we use is actually not, not sort of a, a pure PRF per se, we use something that, that is called more like an oblivious PRF. We actually use a, a different version of an oblivious PRF, but let me build that. Let me build that uh, concept. So in an oblivious PRF, what happens is that there is a participant and a delegate or a server. In this case, I'll call it the delegate. Um, and the participant is going to compute this, this PRF uh, by using sort of a random element, right? Uh, a blinding factor, let's call it R. And so he's going to output C, which is uh, this FR of X, and he's going to send C to the delegate. And then the delegate is going to add the K to the to C, right? So it's going to send back C to the K, which is really F of RK to the X, right? Of X, sorry. 
And um, here what we see is that basically the participant inputs a value X, the delegate inputs a value K. And what happens at the end is that the participant is going to remove the blinding factor that it added in the first place in order to hide X, right? It's really there to, for doing that. But now the output is really FK of X. And now we can see that sort of FK of X is the output of the, of the uh, protocol for computing the, the PRF where the participant doesn't know K and the delegate doesn't know X, okay? And this is very important. Um, Specifically, I can give you sort of a, a, a glimpse into the into the next slides where if you think about doing, uh, you know, this this oblivious PRF for X and Y at the end of the process, FKX and FKY, you can check whether FKX and FKY are equal, because if they are equal, then the, the hash being deterministic is the, the PRF being deterministic is going to give you the same value while being secure right? and not being able to learn the actual values. Um, but in our PSI, because we said that we actually delegate sort of the, the MPC and the matching, uh, we actually need the delegate to see the output of this oblivious PRF. And in the process, why don't we try to take a, to remove one round of interaction, right? So here we have sort of three rounds, right? Uh, or sorry, two messages. But if we wanted the delegate to see the PRF, we would need sort of a third round where the participant sends the, the, um, the output, right? Well, actually, we want to remove sort of two messages uh, completely. So there's, it's going to be a, a purely based on one message. And how do we do that? Where now the participant, instead of sending only C, uh, and this is, by the way, is a straw man. You, you'll see why it's a straw man example, but uh, we'll see the real thing in a second. Uh, instead of only sending C, he's going to send C and R, R being the blinding factor. And of course, now, you know, that's why it's not secure. The delegate can already like brute force and get X, but just bear with me for a second because uh, there is some insight to be shared here. And um, the delegate is going to, again, add the, the key. So it's going to compute FR K of X. And at the same time, it's going to remove the R, right? And at the end, he's going to see F K of X. But again, of course, this is not secure. So what is going to be our solution? It's going to be to distribute R and K using a secret sharing scheme, right? Um, because again, if you had the delegate, even, even without seeing R, if the delegate could compute F K of X and it knows K, it can again, get X. Right? So we need to distribute both R and K using secure secret chain. And that really just brings us to the actual protocol flow where, um, I hope, I hope you can see this, uh, sort of big enough, but essentially here we have again, like the participant data being, uh, X. And what happens is that the uh, participant is going to blind, uh, a, sorry, sample some, some random values, some random shares, R1 to Rn, because now we have M delegates. And that, you know, the, the multiplication of these, the, the product of these is going to, to be called R, which is R blinding factor. And then the participant is going to do two things. It's going to compute the PRF, right? H of X to the power of one over R, right? So just for convenience of, of later removing the R. So it's going to, to, to exponentiate by the inverse of R in the field. Uh, and we're gonna call this D zero, right? Um, and at the same time, it's going to send each of the shares of R, right? The blinding factor to each of the delegates. And now um, let's start, for example, by, by the first delegate in, in series, you know, as, as we uh, saw in the secret sharing scheme by, by making the shares multiplicative, the way it works is that D zero is now going to be uh, sent to the delegate, to delegate one. And each delegate is, is sort of going to remove a little bit of, of the blinding factor, right? The corresponding share of that blinding factor that they own. And they're going to add their share of the key, right? So K1. Uh, as you can see here, D D1 is just uh, D0 to the power of, of K1 R1. And this is going to be sent to the delegate two, who's going to do the same with their own uh, key and, 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 and blinding factor share until we get to the last one who is going to do exactly that uh, D, sorry, M minus one. This should, is again, a typo, so I'm so sorry about that. To the power of KM RM. And that's going to remove the last part of, of R and is going to add uh, the last share of K, right? Where K again is K1 to KM. And now this is going to be sent to sort of this uh, proxy or matcher, like we, we sort of overload that proxy. Um, um, a, 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 a sort of party in the in the middle of the network, 
and, and I'll explain why, and I can answer some questions uh, around that as well. Um, but uh, this is essentially the, the delegated PSI protocol. Well, the point is that now the matcher who is going to receive you know, several of these elements from different Xs for a given participant, but also from different participants, can actually compute some matches over encrypted data, right? Um, and here, the, the important part to keep in mind is that un, as long as one delegate is honest, right? Every uh, ne neither non, none of the delegates nor the matcher is going to be able to see the actual data X, right? They cannot retrieve it. Um, and of course, by the uh, discrete logarithm as well. So that's about the delegated PSI. Um, I, just to kind of close this for a second, let's let's review the actual protocol in step. So the setup is really that the delegates sample uh, uh, sort of a KI, right, a, a share. The participant then computes the the blinding the blinded PRF, generates the secret shares, and sends uh, the the shares to the delegates. And then the delegates are going to add sort of the the shares and remove the R shares. This is all happens as part of the upload, right? What we call the upload, and that's sort of one message interaction from the side of the participant, right? If you're if you're a customer using this, you can kind of go offline after this happens. And then you're going to have the matching, right? The matching is going to happen at the matcher. And then maybe I could have added, added a fourth here where it's sort of download where when the customer is signing in again, logging in again, there the results from the matches and the intersection are going to be back sent back to the uh, customer. Uh, and it seem, it's also it's almost seamless, right? Sorry. Um, so now we have these matches, right? Like the the the, part, the matcher has ability to compute matches, and maybe I'll say I'll say one one thing here, and that is that uh, it is clear. Uh, I'm sure you've all noticed uh, that the matcher has some leakage of this data, right? Um, and that's because uh, you know it can see, for example, the the actual uh, size of the intersections and, and other uh, metadata like that. But um, it it's in some settings it's not critical. So I'm I'm also happy to talk about that. Um, but now we have these matches, and as we said, now we want to do something with this data, right? So how do we aggregate data? Well, let's use homomorphic encryption. But let's see how we can use it. So for those that are not uh, really uh, um, sort of um, familiar with, with homomorphic encryption, this is really like the, the kind of uh, whole concept of homomorphic encryption in this table. I really like to, to think about it because essentially you, whatever, wherever you start, right, you really start in M, but you, no matter what path you take here, right, all the way through the encryption or, or from here, you're going to end up getting uh, F of M. So the idea is that this layer is where the uh, sort of the party lives. And then these layers where a server, right, uh, a delegated server lives. And the idea is that you know I would encrypt M using some uh, homomorphic encryption function under some maybe my private key, and instead of computing F by myself because it's potentially a, a intensive function computation, then the server would compute this evaluation function based on F. Uh, it's actually based on sort of circuit evaluation, and would essentially get the encryption of F of M. Right, so. Uh, you know, the, the equation really is that the evaluation of the encryption of M is equal to the encryption of F of M. And once this is sent to the uh, client or the customer, then they can decrypt and get F of M back. But now the, this is really for, for sort of a, a one client and one server, right? But we are talking about several clients. So how does that work uh, in an application? Well, Let's add that client, right? So we have sort of one message from, from Alice, uh, who's going to compute some, some ciphertext, and another message M2 from Bob, right? The key point here to observe is that they both need to encrypt their messages based on the same, using the same public key. Because, you know, if not, you're not going to get, uh, you're not going to, the, the, the aggregator uh, party is not going to be able, the server is not going to be able to add those ciphertexts unless you're using something even fancier like multi-key homomorphic encryption, which is less practical today. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a whole different uh, conversation we can have. Um, and then when, when you, know, you encrypt under the PK, 
the you send these these ciphertexts so C1 PK and, and C2 PK um, to some server, and then the server is going to evaluate based on some function, right? And and the idea is that you want to get sort of the encryption of the function of the messages uh, by by computing this evaluation circuit. And what happens now is that okay, well, this encryption is actually under uh, PK, right? So maybe I, I definitely should add here PK, but now the question really is who has the SK, the secret key corresponding to this public key? And if you say, okay, these two parties have SK, then, okay, so why did they even encrypt it? Like if they have a common secret, could they have not done something by themselves? Um, or what if, you know, they encrypt different things and, and now you, you say, okay, maybe you would have wanted that every pairwise party has a common key, but what if you need to aggregate things from three different sources? So the key here is that this can get complicated very fast. And the best thing to do is to use this kind of re-encryption method where this aggregator is going to actually have the secret key. And, and yeah, if that triggered a bell because uh, it can be insecure, I'll say that in a second, but assume for a second that this is a server and it has the secret key. Um, then in some sense, uh, what, what can happen is that this, this party is going to re-encrypt the ciphertext C to, that is encrypted under PK to be encrypted under PK1 and PK2, where now PK1 is the public key associated to a secret that is unique to this uh, party. And this is also, a, a, a SK2 is a secret unique to Bob, right? And of course, as I said, right, if, if, uh, if the owner of SK, right, if the aggregator has SK, it can decrypt all the values, which we don't want. So what do we do? Again, we use the same model as before. We reuse the flow and architecture of the delegates, and we distribute the secret key. So how does that look like? Well, I'm going to sort of say a few things about the actual scheme that we use. Uh, I won't get into the concrete math. I did put the pictures there, but because I think it can be interesting to some. Um, but before we see the whole protocol, uh, I want to share these, these insights. So the idea here is that, um, again, you're going to have a distributed key generation, right? Where essentially each delegate is going to generate a different SKI, okay? Individually, right? And then there is sort of a common public key, right? CKP or CP, CPK, sorry, um, that is going to be generated, but uh, in in sort of a single, uh, for a single message, right? So it, there is not even interaction between the delegates. There, it's a one message uh, that is sent to a coordinator and, and it's securely uh, generated. And then each participant is going to input their data, XI, and you want to essentially have a, a collective output, right, of, of f of x1 to xn. And you can see here the functions, right, where, where you're going to encrypt using the common key. Um, and, uh, and then you're going to sort of evaluate all of these, be able to evaluate these and um, have the, the output be the encryption of these things. And of course, if you want to decrypt, you need the secret keys. But what we said, right, is that we're going to want to re-encrypt this ciphertext C prime to the public keys or the, the secret keys of each individual participant that whose data was aggregated. Okay. And the way we do that is by, by using this, um, this sort of re-encryption or key switching method. Um, so uh, um, again, I, I'll say the following, which is that we don't want the delegates to be able to decrypt, right? So the key switching protocol uh, sort of actually happens, sorry, so th this is actually the um, generation of the public key, the common public key, I, 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 just to show that it is done in, in a single uh, round where each party samples some randomness and compute something, and, and then this is uh, publicly aggregated. And what happens is that, um, we can use this idea of collective key switching, where essentially, if you have right some uh, ciphertext, you want to essentially compute um, the partial decryption or the decryption of this ciphertext, and at the same time, encrypt it under a different public key, PK, right? But the key here is that we want this to happen purely without the delegates or without the party that does the collective key switching 
without them seeing the value under the ciphertext. Okay. And this is, by the way, the paper. Sorry about that. This is the paper that. Um, yeah. Okay. That I'll share the the slides at some point. So, what does this key switching look like? Uh, without getting into the details, because again, the homomorphic encryption scheme we use is the uh, BFV uh, scheme. If, if you are uh, any familiarity with it, but it's based on lattices, and it's definitely not easy to start explaining lattices, at least not in a short time. And the idea here is that. Uh, again, you have some public key PK prime and some ciphertext encrypted under PK. And each party that owns a secret key is going to compute these values, these H0i and H1i. And no need to think about the math explicitly, but just to know, to see that it's actually, again, a one round, right? So the parties are using their own secrets, right? As a private input, SI, this is a private input. The rest is all public inputs, right? And what's going to be outputted is the ciphertext encrypted under PK prime. And as you see, the, um, the, the parties, the delegates computing this key switching do not know the secret associated to PK prime, right? Because in order to do public encryption and encrypt, you don't need to know a secret. So that should be kept as a, as a heuristic here. And so what happens is that they compute these um, two elements, and then they're going to output those so that the, there is a public aggregation phase that is going to output the new ciphertext. Sorry about that. Um, so you can see that, that again, this is sort of happens in, in one round. Um, and what you get at the end is this new ciphertext. And now when you encrypt these, you can send these to the different parties. OK, so maybe this couple of last slides were a little bit uh, math heavy or intensive, uh, but Let's kind of put it all together, OK? So again, what's, what happens during this, this homomorphic encryption uh, flow is the following. At the beginning, you have a setup where essentially you have um, the delegate keys, OK? Each one of the delegates generates a different secret, right? Individually, independently, SK1 to SKM. And then uh, let's say the, the coordinator, who we, again, we can overload the, the proxy uh, in the network, is going to do the aggregation of the uh, public key, OK? And again, it's done. It's public operation, right? So there, that can be done, and it's secure. And then what's going to happen that um, we're going to get, say, Alice, Bob, and Charlie, uh, but let's just focus on Alice and Bob for a second, that they're going to each encrypt the value A and B, OK? They're going to encrypt it, again, using their the public key of the delegates, PKD, right? The common public key. So you're going to, they're going to send the ciphertext to uh, the coordinator. And then here, the, the, this is where sort of the PSI flow and the homomorphic encryption flow come together, uh, where after there is a match, right? The matcher or the coordinator the, is going to aggregate the values associated with those matches in the specific way that it's defined, right? Using the specific function. Uh, it could be additions, include multiplications, it could be sorting, it could be other kinds of things. And um, they're going to, the matcher is going to add the ciphertext, right? Again, it's a homomorphic uh, scheme. And these are going to be then sent to the delegates, right? But now the key here is that, for example, um, once Alice, say, signs in again into the system, the system is going to generate the pair uh, route locally. She's going to generate a pair of, of keys, a new pair of keys, SKI and PKI. And then these uh, keys are going to be sent again as well to the matcher, who then is going to send to the delegates, to each delegate, the ciphertext, the aggregate ciphertext C, and the public key PKA of Alice. Okay. What happens is that each delegate this now is not in series, right? Last time we saw in, in the PSI setting that there is an in-series protocol in some sense. And in here, it's actually in parallel. So each delegate is going to have sort of a partial decryption, right? They're going to compute their H values, right? Which are these H values. I, I just abbreviated them to, to have to one, but it's these exact values. And each one of them is going to do the same and send these H values to the coordinator. And then the coordinator, as you can see here in blue, is going to do the aggregate step, 
right? If you see here, this aggregate step of adding the different values and outputting the new ciphertext, right? Um, that's what the coordinator is going to end up doing. And the nice thing about this is that throughout all of this process, neither the matcher nor the delegates actually saw or got to be able to see the underlying values, not A, not B, and not A plus B, right? And then once this process is done, the matcher is going to send or the coordinator is going to send this uh, newly encrypted ciphertext C prime A, right? Which is the re-encryption of the ciphertext C under the public key of Alice. And then Alice finally just takes the secret key and decrypts it and gets the actual result of A and B, right? Uh, in this case, the function is uh, just addition to, to simplify it. But again, this could be any function and it would still give him, give her uh, the actual result of the function. So, and again, the, the next nice thing is that all of this is actually uh, secure as long as one delegate is honest, right? So making sure that the delegates are distributed and then you get the full security is, uh, is important. And you can now see how sort of the PSI comes together with the homomorphic encryption in order to get some matches and then compute on those matches, right? Um, and uh, just to kind of wrap up, uh, I know I'm a little bit over time, but hopefully, hopefully we'll have time for all the Q&A. We are, of course, uh, thinking about these sort of two next steps, I would say. Um, one of them is sort of a, the idea of proving correctness, right? I've talked to you about security and, and that's amazing because you know that uh, no matter what happens, neither the matcher nor the delegates will be able to get the, the data. So that's full security on the on the privacy of the data. But then you get that um, if the delegates don't, one of the delegates even doesn't compute the, the exponentiation correctly with the right key uh, or you know uh, switches key in the middle of the process or the matcher just decides to leave aside some of the matches, things like this, of course, that is not detectable at this point by the participant. And that could be a problem, right, in some settings, in some contexts. So correctness is important. And the way we want to solve that is actually by using zero knowledge, uh, zero knowledge mm -hmm. proofs, which, you know, mm -hmm. in, a, in the ZK Summit uh, uh, event, you know, mostly talks around zero knowledge. Uh, and as much as my talk wasn't exactly around zero knowledge, this is definitely an important component, right? So this idea of putting together a lot of different uh, privacy enhancing cryptographic uh, techniques is important. And um, essentially, if we think about what would the zero knowledge look like, well, we, we could do sort of, we would need to prove two, re two main things, right? One is that at the matcher, the matches are really done correctly, meaning that there is no false negatives or positives, right? Um, and there are also several techniques for that. Mm -hmm. And the second point to be proven is around, of course, the integrity of data, right? Because the data that is input by the participant is different from the data that is handled by the matcher, we need to prove that the conversion was done correctly, right? So essentially, we need to prove that the delegate's computations was done according to, you know, the algorithm based on some pre-committed keys, right? Key shares. Um, and uh, this, is, uh, this is definitely an, an interesting direction. Uh, there are many ways of actually instantiating this proof. You could use recursive composition or you could use, uh, you know, multi-prover uh, uh, systems. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting direction. And of course, we also have like more uh, engineering problems that, and challenges like data normalization, because, you know, different resources and, and databases will definitely not have the same kind of data. And, you know, if you have a name with capitals, letters or or, you know, uh, numbers with dashes or not, things like this are, are always important to keep in mind. And also ease of deployment, right? When when we're talking about combining so many cryptographic schemes, one needs to really be careful about around the security and also around sort of what aspects can be automated and whatnot, right? Because here we want to make sure that all the encryption and all the decryption happens locally, say on the browser or uh, actually local on the computer, right? Um, and uh, this is really this is really it. Um, you know, there's of course a lot of more to talk and to share, but uh, I'm happy to to take some questions. So thank you, thank you again for for listening. Um, yep. Hey hey. 
Okay, there's some great questions in the chat. There, it's possible some of them have already been answered. So if that's the case, maybe we can move quickly mm -hmm. through that. Like for example, Robert asked, but maybe a little bit of a, a way ago, in the production, what real world entity is represented by a delegated, and I think he meant delegated PSI protocol or delegated obvious. I know that you had on the slide at the time. Um, yeah, I think I think here. Yeah, I think the, I get the end the question, which is uh, who represents the delegates or who holds the delegates. And the key here is that they need to be distributed, right? Different Amazon accounts, AWS or Google Cloud, and that different uh, you know companies, different organizations. And of course, this is a challenge uh, that we need to keep in mind. Uh, we are sort of working through that, um, but um, that's that's sort of the the main idea, right? That the delegates really need to be distributed for this to be secure. The next one is, um, do all delegates need to be online or does this approach support an N of M scheme? Do all the delegates need to be online or is it a, uh, so the next version of this is, is definitely a kind of a threshold version. So far we're, we're really only doing, uh, you know, full delegate online, if you wish. I mean, we know, we actually know how to do a uh, threshold, but we, don't we didn't implement it yet because it's uh, just a little bit more complicated, uh, and you know we have product product par priorities. Uh, do delegates refresh their PRF keys per PSI instance? The delegate. So um, yes, here I'll just sort of make a translation where by PSI instance we mean essentially. Uh, all the types of data or all the data that needs to be sort of matched together, right? Um, we do allow for um, sort of adding more data in a, at a later time. And uh, that's that's a, an interesting feature that we have. We, we have some, some, some methods there, but um, we don't sort of, we could also say just refresh the, the keys for every time some some data is uploaded inside of quote unquote an instance or what we call like a topic essentially, but you need to have uh, some some permit permit uh, permanency over those keys in order to be able to do the matches right. Akash asked, doesn't the coordinator have to be honest if it's doing the aggregation of the delegate secret keys? Yes. So this comes back to correctness. Um, it, uh, it has to be, uh, honest and, you know, uh, the only way to ensure that in this current setting is, would be to use something like zero knowledge or at least just a, a proof, right? It doesn't necessarily have to be zero knowledge because the computation is not secret. Um, but, uh, there is, there is a component here of, as I said, like correctness is important and, you know, we're working through that. Um, but you know, it comes at the expense of, of other things at this point. Mm -hmm. What about the matcher being dishonest is the HE PSI? I think this is the same question. Um, okay. Coordinator and matcher he, here. I mean, yeah, because <laughs> essentially the, you know, one is about the aggregation of the secret keys to, to generate the correct public key. Uh, but the other one is about uh, sort of uh, actually doing the computation on the HE or the PSI. Again, like the matcher at this point is a trusted entity, but mm -hmm. is not, uh, but, but even if it's malicious, it cannot be, um, it cannot uh, uh, sort of get the actual data of the participants. Cool. Um, Hubert asked, what circuit depth for the HE function have you tested as being practical? So we've been working mostly with like, like really large amount of additions. Uh, and some multiplications, maybe like averages and things like this. So it's not like we have a, a large depth. Um, we are aware that maybe using like a fully homomorphic encryption scheme is a bit of an overkill if that's sort of the only computations that we have. But there is definitely a scenario where, uh, you know, users are going to start asking for uh, a lot more complex stuff. So, um, you know, we're testing some things. I just, they're not ready to be shared at this point. Not, not optimized enough. Okay. Victor was asking, is it possible that the court, is it possible that the coordinator exclude individual records? 
I guess this kind of goes back to that dishonest question. Right. So here, this is exactly what I meant sort of in the uh, no false negatives or positives, right? Because what this means is that we want to make sure that the matcher, um, exactly that, does not leave any matches out and does not add any matches that are not supposed to be matches, right? Because mm -hmm. if, if, I'm a, if I'm a customer and I just get some matches, I, I need to trust that those are the actual matches, um, I, if, especially if I'm not interacting with my counterparty, right? Um, um, Victor actually clarified this question saying, can the coordinator distinguish individual records or all, are all the records bundled and encrypted together? Um, well, they all look sort of random to the matcher. So they, he, I mean, the matcher can uh, distinguish in the sense of they know that two records are different. It just doesn't know what the delta is. What, it doesn't know anything are, about okay. it. Yeah, it's just sort of random strings all the way, right? It just they the matcher does get some leakage in the sense of it knows exactly what two match what two records match, um, but uh, yeah, and it, I mean it also knows you know what set of hashes belong to which party because he, he's also also acting as the proxy. So, you know, ne next uh, version, I guess, could also be separating between what we call the matcher, what we call the proxy and what we call the coordinator or something like this. Hmm. Um, I hope that clarifies it, Victor. Madi asked, do delegates execute the same partial decryption algorithm independent of their secret keys or is it to be run under their own secret keys or their um, own secret keys <laughs> so here i think what you mean is this uh, partial decryption um and um the answer i mean if i understand the question correctly but please do do correct me madi if i'm if i'm wrong is yes it's independent i mean each delegate has their own secret key sk1 sk2 and so on and the partial decryption that they do happens completely independent without any uh, sort of interaction with the other delegates. And that's the nice thing that there is like a one message to like a coordinator or uh, something like this that will aggregate these H values uh, from each of the delegates, right? We, we always try to, uh, when designing this protocol, we always try to kind of have a one message interaction uh, in the different parts where interaction is needed because of the distribution of the secret keys and shares. Doron asked what PSI construction does HE support? Um, not sure what you mean by that. I mean, uh, we sort of built our own PSI, like based, based on several components from different PSI papers. And uh, the, the, in some sense, what I explained here was that there is like two flows, really. One is the PSI flow, and the other one is the homomorphic encryption flow. So they can really just be to put together as long as you have this ability of, uh, you know, we use the same architecture just in a, in a different uh, order, let's say. First, uh, you know, the, the PSI happens first. So uh, the first flow for PSI is that the participants talk to the delegates on the upload. And when I say talk, I mean like sort of quotation marks talk to the delegates on the upload phase. But then after they've gone offline, when they go online again and they want to get the download query, then uh, that's when they interact again with the delegates in order to get the homomorphic encryption uh, done, right? Um, so I hope that clarifies that. but. Uh, cool. There is no sort of specific construction in, in the HE, like it's, yeah. And I think we have a great kind of last question here. Is this operational or currently in development? Is it live? So I will say both. Uh, you can actually go today uh, and uh, try this out using, your, using an Excel sheet. Uh, if you go to like Microsoft's uh, 365, uh, and, and go into the Excel there, you can actually download the Kedit plugin or add-on. I don't remember what they call it, but, and you can use this uh, and try it. I, I don't think that we implemented there the homework encryption, but 
Uh, going back to the answer, like the question, it's operational in the sense that we are working with several customers to sort of work through through their use cases, and and you know we're running uh, real data through this. Uh, but it's not in, in deployment yet in the proper sense of the word, uh, you know, where you just go into the website and, and pay with a credit card and use it or something like this. I mean, um, maybe, maybe, after, like that. maybe after this chat, if you want to put any links or something into the chat, that might actually be useful for any documentation or any, any way for people to start accessing it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I would cool. love it. All right, so thank you so much, Daniel. Thanks for thank uh, doing thank this you. talk and your first talk at the ZK Summit. <laughs> Very yes, cool. Yes, indeed. It's a crossover episode. Um, <laughs> all right, so uh, to everyone else, we will Hi. cut the stream here and we'll be back here in about eight minutes for Alex from Matter Labs' talk. Cool, see you soon.